Hello, we're here with uh, General Rick Hillier. Uh, General Hillier, welcome to the Eurasia Typhoon School of Business. Thank you very much, I'm glad to be here. General, I would like to ask you three questions. Please. When did you first realize that, that you were a leader and what made you recognize this? Well, I realized it very early in life. Uh, first of all, I, I uh, applied to join the Canadian Forces early. In fact, I, I applied to join when I was about eight years old and, and, uh, and really wanted to be nothing else but a soldier all my life. And I wanted to be a leader as a soldier, though I wasn't sure what that meant. When I did join, however, from the very first day of I started basic training as an officer and then went through my specialty training as an armored officer, the one thing that was imprinted on all of us from our officers and our non-commissioned officers who instructed us, seasoned professional leaders themselves, was that we were leaders first and foremost. And yes, we might be tank specialists or we might be fighter pilots or any of the others, but first and foremost, we were leaders. It was impressed upon us every single day. Secondly, our preparation, the training, the education, the experiences that we got, and the assessments uh, and the criticisms, if I could put it that way, that we received were all about how well we were doing as leaders and not about the specialty trades per se. So that was important. When I arrived at my first operational unit, it was brought home to me in spades. And after about three weeks on the ground, I was in command of a platoon of about 35 soldiers. I was a smoker, as many of us were back in those days in the, in the late 70s. And after about three weeks or so, one of my senior non-commissioned officers in the platoon uh, saw me lighting up a cigarette, and I think he probably had one. He said, sir, what kind of cigarettes do you smoke? I don't remember what I said, you know, Rothmans or something. And I said, well, why do you ask? He said, sir, two-thirds of the platoon smokes. You watch. In two or three weeks, they will be smoking the same brand of cigarette that you do. And it was just a, a small lesson, but an incredibly important one, and what an effect you have, how you imprint upon people, and how you are seen as a leader by them. And, and then I was blessed uh, to have access to, to serve for, uh, to, to work with many incredible leaders in the Canadian Forces and some of the civilians who supported us. And, and, I, and I took their examples of leadership, of how to focus on people, uh, how to uh, be decisive in tough situations, how to look after yourself so you could be a more effective leader and keep developing your skill sets. And I think so continuously throughout my career, uh, it was brought home to me that if I was an officer, I was a leader and that was what uh, mattered most. And then every day on operations, whether as a younger officer or whether as a commander in Afghanistan, as a lieutenant general, it was clearly brought home to me that when things went tough, particularly uh, tough days, bad days, dark days, the eyes of the, whether it's a thousand or 20,000 people, went directly to their leader, which was me. And that brought it home uh, just one more time. So I think constantly throughout my entire life, and it was the training, the preparation, but also the actions of the people uh, who followed me, who worked beside me and for whom I worked. Okay. General, how did you learn to lead? And in particular, what were some of the hardest things to learn? Well, I think I learned most of my leading and I'm not sure how much I have of it uh, from what I would call a school of hard knocks. And that's a bit of an exaggeration because when you, the Canadian Forces actually has a very solid professional development program from the time you join as usually a young man or woman to the time you, you reach the strategic uh, leadership levels in senior ranks and I certainly had the benefit of that and thus as a younger officer you know 18 and 19 years old uh, I had tough tactical leadership training I had educational uh, preparation I had the example of others and I and we didn't call it mentoring back in the 70s and 80s 80s but it certainly was mentoring in, a, in perhaps a more ruthless and harsh form than you would normally see in a corporation but it was mentoring nonetheless and so uh, I learned a lot through the formal program I learned a lot through the informal program of, of sometimes having a social beer, uh, a social moment with uh, many of the leaders that I respected. And I learned a lot from the people that followed me because they uh, weren't silent about what they needed in a leader. And they weren't silent when you did well, they let you know that. And they also weren't silent when you didn't do well. And they would let you know that things had not uh, perhaps gone as well as they should have and you should have paid more attention. I quickly learned myself there were about four things that I focused upon myself and they were really three legs of a stool with the kind of seat that brought them all together. Number one was training. You can actually train and practice to lead so you can make decisions in, in stressful moments. So you can actually go through a thorough assessment because you've practiced it so many times very quickly and therefore you can articulate what you want people to achieve and help them to it. 
Training is important. Secondly, education is important to understand the, the psychological and the physiological makeup of men and women and, and what their fears and fantasies and dreams and, and aspirations are and how you perhaps uh, bring them along based on those fundamental needs of people. So training was one leg of the stool. Uh, education was one leg of the stool, but so was experience. And in the Canadian Forces, I had the benefit of having a great balance of both domestic experience, that is to say experience here in Canada, and whether that was on natural disaster assistance to Canadians or simply normal training and preparation, I had the opportunity to have international experience to serve with soldiers and, and civilians of uh, you know 40 different countries. I had the opportunity to have troop time, so working with people who were following you in active units. I had the opportunity of having staff time where I was in the planning cycle or the strategic planning cycle for various headquarters. And I had the opportunity to have combat, uh, command time uh, versus that troop time also. So I had a pretty incredible uh, triangle or three legs of the stool of training, education and experience. But the, the, the part that brings them together, the seat of it, if you will, was the mentoring piece. Mm -hmm. and, and as I mentioned earlier, I had some incredible officers, incredible leaders, officers and non-commissioned officers uh, with whom I worked, for whom I worked over, over years. And they, through astute little ways, managed to make sure that I learned from everything that I did that was wrong. Uh, that I realized once in a while when I had done something right and could reinforce that. And in short, they were mentoring me in a way that I didn't even appreciate perhaps at the time, but certainly picked it up. Okay. And the third question, what are some of the ways that you use to develop the leadership talent around you? Well, uh, I think the first way, is the mo and that's the most important way, is as a leader yourself, to be out with the people that are following you, working for you, to the extent so much that you get to know them thoroughly. And from that, then you start to assess the potential of the people that you have, and particularly the potential of those who are going to be leaders or can be leaders or want to be leaders. Only when you start with that basic sort of principle of knowing your people, can you actually select out those who want to be leaders, who have much potential to be great leaders, and start putting an emphasis into what they are going to do to help the entire organization be successful. That's part number one. I saw a lot of people who didn't do that, and I made a vow to myself early in my career in the Canadian Forces that I was going to spend enough time out that I'd know the people, and they would know me as a leader. That was part one. Part two was to make sure the amount of training we did at the leadership level was appropriate. And at times in the Canadian Forces, we got too much training and too little education on the leadership side. And so there was a good balance to find there, and, and particularly during my time as commander of the Army and chief of defense staff, we really focused on getting the balance right, particularly at the young leader level, in fact, at the young leader right through to the senior strategic leader level, getting a balance of training versus education. Thirdly, we really did uh, spend an enormous amount of time on the last two pieces, uh, which was ensuring that we could help the, the high potential leaders first, but as many leaders as possible get exactly that right brand of experience, much as what I described for myself, domestic, international, staff time, troop time, command time, combat time, and because that made a fuller individual. And combining that with the mentoring that every single senior leader had to bring. And I, I will say that uh, the development of leaders, what a lot of people would call succession planning, because in the Canadian Forces we had a different equation. We had to grow our own leaders mm -hmm. uh, and we couldn't hire from the competition. That is to say, I could not hire my generals from the Taliban. And so we had to grow our own and we wanted to get that part right. And so our mentorship again became the glue uh, around which all this revolved. That meant that probably 35% of my time, at least 30%, but probably 35% of my time was spent doing leadership development and succession planning in, in the Canadian Forces for the folks who followed me to ensure that my successors were going to be up to the job. General Hillier, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure.